Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio. I'm your host, Diane Floyd Bame, and our show today is The Corner Bookstore. If you're joining us for the first time today, wherever you are in the world, we are thrilled to have you, and thank you to our dedicated listeners. Dr. Jacqueline, founder and CEO of USA Global TV and Radio, is producing the show today. Guess what? We are welcoming back our guest, Linda Schmidt, an award-winning author. I'm so excited to see what she's been up to and all about her new book that she has. So let's give a big warm welcome to Linda. Bring her on out. Hey, Linda. Hi, Diane. Hi. It's great to see see you. you. So where are you in the world right now? Well, I'm living in Panama. Um, We moved here last August 1st, Mm -hmm. so it hasn't been a year yet. And still kind of getting our legs or, you know, transitioning, even though we had this as a vacation home before and we've been here, it's not the same as living. And um, it's a Spanish community and my Spanish um, language is poco y poco, (laughs) but, uh, you know, you just kind of embrace the challenges and enjoy life. I just, I love the vibe here. It's, it really is uh, a tranquil vibe. And I feel the Panamanian culture is very much in the moment, very family oriented, very emotion centered. And that just suits me. So. I'm, oh, I'm really happy with the move. That's great. And where did you move from? I moved from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> okay, so you went from Saudi to there. and But where's your, your home state? Yeah, my home is Canada. I was born uh, in uh, the prairies in Saskatchewan, 1966. So pretty. Nice. And, well, you know. <laughs> I like the prairies. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it's. You like what you don't know sometimes or or what's different and and unique. But actually, we didn't spend that much time in the prairies. We moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 10, we were moving to BC uh, and lived there until 14 and then Calgary. And I spent most of my adult life living in Calgary, Alberta which I guess is considered prairies too. So I have to take that back, (laughs) but it's close to the Rockies. It is close to the Rockies and British Columbia obviously is gorgeous, but um, you know, I'm so glad you shared this with our listeners because um, sometimes, you know, people don't understand what it's like to just, you know, just move to a different state or a different part of your country in Canada. Um, But you're like me, you have traveled and you know, once you have that opportunity to explore different cultures, it's hard to kind of give that up, don't you think? We'll see. I've only been here, as I said, less than a year, and I'm not craving to leave again. We spent seven years in Saudi Arabia, and uh, I can say that I have a really deep feeling that it was the exact around amount of time that we needed, if you can use that word, to, mm-hmm. to be there and, and what that experience gave us. Um, I was ready to go when we mm-hmm. did. And part of me feels like nesting, but another part of me, as you say, um, feels excited by the idea of travel and mostly because 
it affords you the opportunity to really have a broader perspective of humanity and what it's like to live from a different cultural perspective. And I feel like that's um, something that I have really appreciated about being so fortunate to, to have those opportunities. I could so. not agree more. But now let's get back into your writing. You have been book signing. Um, I'm just like so impressed when I read all your updates and my hat is off to you, award winner oh, author. Thank you. <laughs> You're thank welcome. You. So you want to start with your launch of your new book? Sure, I'd love to. Um, as you know, it's a long time behind the scenes from the idea of a book to the publishing of the book. And um, I've compared it to childbirth, but not as difficult, but it is <laughs> I, I do know. <laughs> here's my fourth baby here. And, um, you know, it started off as an idea that was really vague about the scorpion message. And, and that's a kind of a long journal story, but I was here in our home in Panama and I saw a scorpion live for the first time. It really scared me. And as part of my way of managing my fears, I did some research about what scorpion uh, symbol symbology is all about. And that's what got me thinking of the story because it was about how scorpions can be a message of needing to be discerning um, and beware of who you trust and that there might be someone toxic in your life. And it turned out that that was a situation that was developing at the time. And so that was a core starting point for writing this novel. And as the way that I've heard people speak about some people's process as authors is very outlined and some is more what they call a pantser. And that's probably describes me more where it's something that comes to you um, sort of organically through your process as you're writing. The next part comes as I'm in one part. And so Anne was asking me, um, my publisher and, and yours uh, for some of your books as well at OC Publishing about that. Um, when did I decide to add certain elements that are in the Rogue? And I said, I didn't really pre-decide that just occurred to me as I was writing of, oh, this is something, or I'd written a little bit and I was sitting with it, contemplating where I was going to go next. And it just, I've been really fortunate that way that I have a really strong connection between my intuition and my, my writing creativity. They're in alignment. So that's so how there that you go. Go away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a lot to share. I'm so glad you did. Um, I'm going to first start with, wow, when I see a scorpion, and I can remember seeing that one for the first time and not knowing what that thing was, they're very strange looking. And then mm. my husband tells me what it is. And I'm not like, deadly, 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 you know, <laughs> it's going off. And I'm like, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. And, and you go and you research and what you discover <laughs> is like the last thing I would do right <laughs> but what you discover okay, is but so interesting no well Diane in fairness that was after I did the David <laughs> okay good and, and he he got the scorpion out of the house and then I went and researched I didn't you know, let him sit there and start and watch no, you. No, he, was... he didn't become your best friend as you're writing. Oh, wait, you need to put uh -uh. this in. <laughs> Definitely not. And being from Canada where there's no such thing as scorpions. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, it's that whole thing of being unfamiliar. Yes. Not that I would maybe be well equipped to handle a bear or a moose or something common to Canada yeah. either, but I wouldn't be as terrified because yeah. you're used to seeing them. And this was, as you said, something I'd never seen before. And then, you know, they have kind of a bad rap and deservedly because <laughs> they're, they're toxic. And, right? They are toxic, yes. And apparently they enjoy the whole idea of killing their prey before they eat it. They do some little dance. And <laughs> oh, my gosh. You learned more than I Take ever wanted to know. And I was like, oh. <laughs> So, oh my goodness gracious. Um, on a side note, we'll get straight back to you. I was thinking about 
Well, if you come to Texas, watch out. You might see flying roaches. So, <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I don't know if do. I'm up for that. Yet. Yeah, they do fly. But um, going back to the scorpion. So I'm like you. I'm a pantser in my writing. And it's really fun because it just flows, right? But then you do go back and you look at your editing. So I think we're kind of a hybrid in, in reality by the time yeah. we finish everything. So how long does it take you to... Um, finish or write a book? Does it take years? Do you have it done in like a month? Yeah, somewhere between there. I was just listening to an interview with Karen Dean, who I'm friends with and, and I've read her best-selling book, We Are Unbreakable. And she said that she had the idea come to her in October and had the book published by that November. Wow. And that kind of blew my socks off. Right. So, um. And now it's a collection of interviews. It's a nonfiction. So I understand I've written a nonfiction and it didn't take as much time as the novels have. But roughly, I would say it takes me about a year to get the story and my initial editing to see, do I feel like it's ready for someone to see? Mm -hmm. And I've developed... Um, through my process from the first book till now, a pretty detailed 11 step uh, editing outline. And then when I'm there, uh, of course, the first time I didn't know what I was going to do. And then <laughs> since then I've been working with Anne. And so I know it's going to her and the process from when she accepts the manuscript and starts the editing process, she has begun the editing process on all of my books. And then we've had additional editors as well. So that, and then the proofread and getting the cover and the interior layout, uh, advanced readers, all that takes about another year. So I would say two years is a good estimate of the total time for a book from inception to being published. But that's very good. Very good. And, you know, for us listeners, you know, I, I'm predominantly write children's books and, uh, the, there's the research you don't have to do. But for you, research is extremely important in some of your novels. And um, so to do that in two years, still, my hat's off to you. But you brought up Thank the you. cover. Can you show everyone mm. the cover? Oh, I just kind of cool. This yeah. Isn't it beautiful? It is gorgeous. Now, was it and this, the person uh, you know, the illustrator? Yeah, and in fact, um, that is an interesting aspect of this book. So I'm going to transgress a little bit, but my first two novels were based on real life, and the main character, Kate Henderson, is someone who journals, and I'm someone who journals. So um, that was a um, really integral part of those stories. So when I wrote this book, I decided I wanted my main character to be an artist. Um, and so I reached out to a friend of mine who is an artist. She lives in the UK. I met her when I lived in Saudi Arabia. And I asked her, would she be willing to collaborate with me so that Isabella here could be um, having artwork throughout the book? So for instance, um, Here's the artwork for the beginning of chapter two. If you can see wow. that. I'm, I'm bad at this line. No, no, thing. this is great. Wow. Can, that's can you see beautiful. that? Yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. She's so talented. And so there's 15 chapters and there's 15 pieces of artwork that are part of Isabella Ricci's, uh, my main character, her sketchbook journal. And that's her way of processing the difficult things that come up over the course of the story, as well as celebrating the lovely things that that occur for her and just kind of getting her thoughts clear. She does it through drawing. So I felt like that really added a really rich level of authenticity to the novel. Those elements coming together of the main character is an artist and there's art throughout it. And also the uh, imagery does uh, foreshadow some things that are coming up in the chapter. So it has a nice element that way. So uh, I was really pleased with the decision. And it's exciting what you're doing because um, that's a trend that's starting to happen that I'm excited about that 
uh, quote, grown up books um, are starting to, you were starting to see more illustrations go with it, where, you know, it used to be like, oh, I've graduated from children's books, and now I have just a little bit, and now I'm chapter books, and I only have, I only have words, and you feel so grown up, but people are really wishing for that illustration to come along with it. So, so you are on the beginning of the new trend, young lady. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's unusual. <laughs> Usually I'm 10 years behind. I'm like, oh, is that popular? So <laughs> no, that's, really that's nice to know. <laughs> that's really good. So tell the purpose or what you're hoping to get out of this book, and then we'll take a commercial. And then when we come back, we'll have you um, read from it. So okay, what's, what's your takeaway you want the readers to know? Well, with all my novels, my biggest uh, objective, I would say, is to really delve into the human experience in all its complexity and with a focus on the emotions that we feel as human beings. And so it takes a different turn depending on the novel. But in this novel, The Rogue Scorpion, um, it's really about a quest to discover her authentic self and also to accept who that is and to um, deepen her spiritual experience. So uh, those are the main themes. And there's a lot of su more subtle uh, themes around. It, it, it is a love story. It is a story about resilience and overcoming adversity. And I look at stereotypes and prejudice and overcoming those. Um, family relationships, as well as that inner uh, listening to your intuition. And one of the things that I did with the Rogue Scorpion is have Isabella's spiritual journey be led somewhat by different books she reads, both fiction and nonfiction that explore spirituality, which is something that I have done in my life and found to be really worthwhile endeavor of broadening, like we talked about with the travel, it's broadened my idea of how to be in relationship with God. So I love just that. Stuff. Just, <laughs> just, just a few things. There's a lot to take in there. I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> and it, and now that you've shared the purpose and everything and you shared of like what scorpions represent and all of that, it really, it really fits in with, with where you went. It's pretty incredible. So let's take our Thank commercial you. back break and uh you get geared up to read one of your favorite passages in the meantime sounds good okay there we go take it away <laughs> Season usa global tv and radio presents international award-winning author speaker educator diane floyd bame I want to thank everybody for joining us today on this special edition of the corner bookstore usa global tv and we're talking with the co-host of the Corner Bookstore, uh, Diane Floyd Bain today, who is herself an author, uh, an author of many books, not just children's books, but also books for adults. Diane, welcome to the Corner Bookstore. Everyone should have their own library. Even children should start developing their library and know that what happens in a garden, it grows. And I went their library to grow and never ever get rid of a book because what you might have enjoyed as a child reading and re having lovely memories of your parents reading as you get older, you'll grow to cherish those books in another way. My specialty is to help people realize that we are all storytellers and that if you have this yearning to get this story out but you don't know how to get started i want to be the person that you know you can come to you can feel comfortable with i'll learn your personality we'll just go and have itty bitty baby steps just like in my book a time to fly before you know it the young new author is ready to fly to and go to super professional coaches Diane's books are available now at dianefloydbame.com. Charlie and the Tire Swing, How It Began, A Time to Fly, A Song of Peace, Rise, A Girl's Struggle for More, 
Harry the camel. The little girl in the moon. The little girl in the moon, Moxie and Tycho Town. Moon League Adventures, the Serengeti. <gasps> and I'm saying, go for it. <laughs> Diane Floyd Bames, A Song of Peace, tells the story of a young lad named Tommy, whose fervent wish for peace on earth touches the hearts of his friends and family, spreads to his community, and eventually unites the whole world around making his dream of peace a reality for everyone. Sit down with the children in your life and share Tommy's amazing story of love and hope. Sing your own song of peace and invite the children to join you. Tommy's tale is more than just a story. It's a movement, and everyone's warmly welcome to take part. You'll find a song of peace along with many other wonderful learning and enriching opportunities for children of all ages at DianeFloydBame.com. everybody to the corner bookstore and we have our host linda faye schmidt um and the author and she is going to be reading to us from her latest book come on out linda hi diane that was a great commercial oh, thank um, you they do a great yeah. job that's um um dr jacqueline's team puts it together so i feel very honored so if you need yeah. a commercial, you know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fabulous. And it really does showcase your work so well and the strong messages that you have. You're so, so sweet. We talked. Oh, it's it's going for you. I called you the host, by the way. So. I was so excited to get you in here. <laughs> Which means you'll have to come be a host sometime. Yeah, oh, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows where life will go? Well, let's get going so. with the scorpion. <laughs> Yeah, so actually interesting that we got onto that topic a bit because the section I chose sort of hints very, um, what's the word I want, subtly around that whole Scorpion energy, but doesn't give too much away. So it's a little bit of a glimpse into this dysfunctional relationship that um, Isabella gets into when she's on Vancouver Island. In the new year, Isabella can't shake the strong, persistent yearning. She feels that it's time to make a change. She's just finished The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho and is inspired by Santiago's travel adventures. Just as he felt compelled to leave his flock of sheep in, in, in search of treasure, her soul calls her to switch things up, to give her dual yoga and restaurant gigs up and seek something more fulfilling. Santiago's words, it is the possibility of having a dream come true that makes life interesting, keep turning around in her hat. During her weekly FaceTime with her parents, Tony agrees that getting out of her relationship is past due, while Sylvie worries that picking up and moving on again will only bring more instability into Isabella's life. While Alex is busy working on his novel, Isabella gets out her laptop and Googles information about Panama. 
She finds an Airbnb in the hip looking neighborhood of Casco Viejo for a cheap price and books a plane ticket from Victoria to Panama with a connection through Toronto, leaving the return date open. She gives notice at the cafe and yoga studio. And the only thing she has left to do is break the news to Alex that she's leaving and she's going alone. Part of her knows it will feel so good to finally get it off her chest. The other part of her is terrified of how he will react. She procrastinates until there are only two nights before her departure. How's it coming? Isabella asks, referring to Alex's manuscript. He is bent over the computer at his desk, hard at work as usual. Fine, fine, Alex says, clearly focused. I know you're busy, but I wonder if you could take a few moments to have a conversation with me. Now, Alex says, as if it's the most ludicrous request ever. Yeah, now, Isabella says. I've been trying to tell you something important for weeks, but you keep blowing me off. Alex closes the lid of his computer and stands up, a dark shadow crossing over his face. Sounds serious. I suppose it is, Isabella says. I've booked a plane ticket to Panama. I, I just need to get away for a few weeks, clear my head, think about my future. I'm tired of drifting along, and like you've said more than once, I need to get a grown-up gig. What, Alex says? A plane ticket? What are you talking about? You can't be serious. You're joking, right? I can't possibly take a vacation at this point in my book, this close to my deadline. You know that. Yeah, I do, Isabella says. I wasn't suggesting you go. This is for me. What? Alex says, his brows turning into a scowl. That's even worse. I can't believe you're going to pick up and go just like that. I thought we had something kind of serious developing. Of course we do, Isabella says. It's only for a few weeks. It's perfectly normal for couples to take a break from one another now and again. Alex looks so hurt. It's all Isabella can do not to go online and cancel her ticket. Yet she knows that a big part of her decision to leave is because of him, that she's exhausted by their volatile relationship. I just need some time away, Isabella continues. I love you, but it's not like either one of us is ready to make a commitment. And besides, you're so busy, you'll barely notice I'm gone. Isabella moves closer to him and wraps her arms around Alex's neck. He lowers his head to kiss her. Maybe you're right, Alex says. I am super busy. Sometimes I feel guilty about how little time I have to spend with you. How long did you say you're going for? I might be near the end of my book by the time you get back. I left the return date open, Isabella confesses. I wanted to wait and see if I like it there or not. I've got an accommodation in the city for a week, but I'm thinking of exploring other areas of the country. So I thought it best to leave it open. That sounds like a stupid plan, Alex says. He pulls away and turns into the kitchen, grabs the beer from the fridge and pops it open. Isn't there a hefty fee for the freedom of not choosing a return date? It was a little more, Isabel admits, but less expensive than canceling a flight or rebooking. Anyway, I don't know why you care. It's my money. You know what? You're right. I don't give a shit what you do, Alex says, his mood shifting again. He turns his back to her and picks up the remote for the TV, then plops down on the couch with a huge sigh. While he scrolls through the channels, Isabella quietly grabs her purse and her sketchbook and steps out, careful, close the door softly behind her. Wow. Wow. I love how you read. I, could, I was just right there with you. Um, oh, thank you. And it's so honest. I mean, it was just the dialogue is so truthful and not many authors get that. So congratulations. Uh, that means so much because this whole idea of being authentic, being willing to be vulnerable with the, your truth, it isn't easy to do, even though I'm so pulled in that direction, it's still difficult and not everyone receives it well. And sometimes the way people receive your truthfulness is painful. It, it hurts because they they can't hear it or accept you as you are. But I just feel it's worth it. I feel it's so important for us to share our stories, as as you agree, um, to all have our voice and to listen to one another so that we understand better, not just our own perspective of what life means, 
but other people and where they're coming from and what they bring and what they've been through to develop our compassion and our empathy. And I feel like with each story, instead of writing sort of a how to be a nice person book, <laughs> um, just through an example of a story of that's written from this space of, like you were saying, authentic dialogue that isn't contrived to be a literary masterpiece but that is rooted, really rooted in, in realness and being open and honest about how people uh, navigate all the trials and the triumphs of life and how relationships, they're so important to us, but they have pitfalls and, and things to be on the lookout for. So Absolutely. Yeah, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's true. So, but um, what I, I loved too is that Isabella, she didn't let Alex say, change her mind, you know, like, oh, he didn't, he doesn't agree. It's a good idea. Maybe, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. You know, she, she stood her ground and that was already something probably strong for the character to do in her itty bitty steps to discovering herself or am I on the wrong track? No, I would say she's definitely a work in progress. Um, and uh, I don't want to give too much away, but oh, no. <laughs> near the beginning of the novel, there is a pretty traumatic event for her when she goes to Thailand. Mm -hmm. And that really does um, cause her to have a breakdown in her confidence. Mm -hmm. And so she's been trying to rebuild that. And it's not easy because she was attracted, which often happens to someone with that kind of personality as demonstrated in, in the passage that I read, that is very moody and very controlling and um, not respectful to her. And it takes some awareness on her part to realize that and some uh, having to dig deep and push herself to do it. And, and she's fortunate that she has the support of her parents. She's an only child and she's very much loved and accepted by them. Um, but they're human beings too. And there's some things that she shares with them that they find difficult later in the book. So it's, I hope it's a, an honest representation of what people in, in their lives um, experience as along the way. And of course we don't all share the same thing, but this is an example that could be looked at um, from different perspectives and with other things besides her trauma of just how do we find our footing again? And as I said earlier, you know, her spirituality is a big part of that. Learning to listen to God and, and that voice. And that's part of where that strength comes from in, in her ability to say, I have to do this for myself because Panama is calling her. It's coming up in her drawings. It's coming up on her vision board. She's, she's put a picture of a beach and she doesn't know where it is but she knows it means something and she's willing to take that leap of faith and just follow it and see. And it turns out to, to be a, a big payoff that she does because she finds a lot of great things in Panama. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it because um, as you said, we all have journeys, but I believe anyone, so everyone listening out there and watching uh, grab this book because you're going to go on a journey. It sounds like we also get to travel a little bit as well. You mentioned Thailand and, you know, she's up there north and then she's going to Panama. So it's, it's going to be an interesting read. But also I believe anyone who reads this story is also going to discover things about themselves as well. So yay, I, so. I think so. So tell us about some of your other books before we have to close. Okay, well, as I was mentioning earlier, all of my books are very much character driven. The character has a story to tell, and I do that for them. So the first two books I wrote were a series, and I hadn't planned that either. I wrote the first book very much. It's called The Healing, and it was my personal healing. And I'm sure that's evident for anyone who's read it. Um, I embodied it in my character, Kate Henderson, to create a little bit of distance and give myself room to 
maybe rewrite some parts that needed to be rewritten for, for my healing and not include some things that would be a block towards my healing. And I tried to be as uh, respectful to all the people in my life who the characters are inspired by. But it's a story about transformation. It's a story about overcoming uh, trauma of a dysfunctional relationship. So funny that that's also in The Rogue. Clearly a strong theme for me. And I've lived it. And uh, it's not easy. And I've had so many people say, like, how can you stay in that situation? And I don't have a great answer, except that it's really complex. And trauma scars you in a way that... Uh, it isn't always easy to uncover a healthy way forward, even if you have a lot of confidence in other areas. Um, and I think the more we learn about that, um, the better equipped we are as a society to support one another and have less um, traumatic reoccurrences from, from people who haven't gotten the help and support they need. Um, so after I wrote The Healing, um, a chance conversation, someone wanted to know an interview, something like this, it was a podcast. She was curious, she's a therapist in Toronto, and she was curious about that whole story and wanted to know more of the backstory, because the story with the healing starts in uh, her early 40s. So I chose to write the book going back to the beginning of Kate's birth into the world and her family life and some of her early experiences with things like bullying and abuse and how she overcomes those and becomes who she is and but that story's main theme was about the core strength for her was the love of her family and particularly her father so it's called the holding and it's about her feeling held by her father's love and um after that i decided to write a nonfiction, go off in a completely different direction and that, again, was spurred from feedback about Kate Henderson's journaling process. And did I journal? And I said, yes, I've been journaling for over 20 years. And uh, they were curious about, this was a good friend, um, how did I get started and how would they get started maybe? And I thought, well, isn't that a nice idea of bringing more people into that aspect of my life? So I wrote a companion journal that goes with the series of the healing and the holding and it explores some of the themes in the novels as well as this general theme about discovering your authentic purpose and then living it living your authentic life and that leads me up to the rogue scorpion my fourth book there you go congratulations you know mm -hmm. i've been following you as you know and what i love about you take us on a journey with all your books and in, in each one of them, we walk away growing ourselves, you know, and or I believe, and this is why I want our listeners to really grab your books because I truly love them. But I, I believe that when people read your stories that it may not, it may touch their heart and they understand things, but they may not have lived it yet, but they know someone who's lived it. And now they have a better understanding and can show more empathy and compassion. So I get a lot out of your books. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You are quite I'm thrilled. Um, you know, I'm like any human being, I'm sure uh, I've got big dreams and things that I would like to happen. But at the end of the day, I am very much grounded in my present moment. And for me, the real joy of writing comes in these individual experiences when one person shares how something I've written impacts them. And not just in the novels, I also write a blog that I've been writing. It's called Musings of an Emotional Creature. It's on my website. And I've been writing that since 2016. Uh, in the beginning, it was a bit uh, inconsistent. But for the last few years, it's been a blog a month. And it's nonfiction, but it's written, again, with that same drive to grow awareness, to look at topics that are in the news or that are on my mind of things that are important to, to be discussed. And I dive right in there with that uh, open and honest vulnerability. 
And sometimes I get feedback from those of, well, that poem you wrote really had me resonating with, I need to be spending more time in nature. And sometimes it's just little things like that. Or someone saying, I experienced being in, a, in an abusive relationship and I feel like I was drawn to this book for a reason. Maybe I'm on my way to getting ready to leave. You know, so things like that, oh, they're the uh, fuel for all the harder things around trying to market, which is not something that I'm really skilled at yet and still learning. Um, how to be an advocate for yourself without being, you know, I, I don't want anyone to read my book as a favor or, or feeling pressured, but just uh, for getting the audience that is intended, getting it into their uh, awareness. It's not an easy thing. There's so many, how many is there now? 8 billion people in the world <laughs> and so many different publishers and so many great stories. And so it's just been a really, uh, a really big journey for me, a, a learning growth curve, uh, skyrocketing, although I don't think as big as yours or Dr. Jacqueline's, but you know, no need to compare. We're all on our own path. Right. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I'm um, as we go to close out the show, I'm so glad you brought up your website. And you know, your blog can become a book all by itself if you've been writing it that long. So there, I think you have another story there with all your Ooh, blog stories. You have to give it some <laughs> thought. So share with us uh, real Thank quickly you. all the different ways people can find you and where they can find your books. Okay, well, as you have shown here, I'm so pleased with how my website's come together. It was a work in progress, and I'm really pleased. Um, and that's the best way to get a hold of me, because on my website, you can find out about my books, you can read my blogs, you can read the news and reviews, and get the best sense of what I'm about, and the links for all the um, online ordering with Amazon, Chapters Indigo, and Barnes & Noble are there. So it's the best way. But if that isn't um, something that you're interested in and you prefer other avenues, I am on social media. I do have a YouTube channel. And if you just put in Linda Faye Schmidt, L-Y-N-D-A-F-A-Y-E-S-C-H-M-I-D-T into any of those platforms, you, I will come up and you will find my list of books. It's on Goodreads um, as well. And you can go from there. I was had a really fun time this spring making trailers for all the books. That was an idea that I got in one of the writers groups I belong to here in Panama. So hopefully one of those mediums will uh, attract people and I'll have some, another story for the next time we talk about that someone taking away something. That will be great. We love it. I just want to thank you so much for taking time out and joining us uh, on our show today. You're just a beautiful human being. And I just love um, talking to you as well as hearing all about your adventures in your book. So I hope you'll come back. I would love to. It would be my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Diane, you are one of the early people inspiring me despite our very different genres your dedication to your craft, your dedication to your messages and to uh, your audience uh, is a huge inspiration for me. Oh my gosh, I'm so totally touched. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we shall see you again real soon. Enjoy the warmth of Panama. And if ever you need to come up north to Texas, ha ha ha, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know where Panama is, is, you know, check it out. That's why I can make a pun about coming north, <laughs> even though you're really north way up there in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all over the map, but the love fest extends beyond borders, right? Yes. <laughs> amen. Amen. Okay, well, we'll see you again real soon. Again, thank you so much. Have a great day. Well, Linda is incredible and make sure you go to lindafayschmidt.com to find out all the different ways that you can uh, find out where her books are, join her blog and her newsletter. We authors work so hard on our newsletter to uh, keep you informed and hopefully brighten your day. So make sure you follow Linda Faye Schmidt. In the meantime, that's it. 
for USA Global TV and Radio and the Corner Bookstore. Coming next is going to be another fabulous show. So don't turn off the TV, computer, or radio, whichever way you are listening, because we want you to stay with us and we love you for being part of our family. Have a great day. See you next time.